friends, Elisa Childers here. What's up with everyone's obsession with Richard Rohr? He's a Franciscan friar who seems to be promoting some unbiblical ideas. Recently, he was a guest on the Jen Hatmaker podcast. And today, Marsha Montenegro and I are going to offer our thoughts on that episode in just a moment. haven't heard of the Mama Bear Apologetics book that's coming out on June 4th, I just want to encourage you to go to Amazon and put Mama Bear Apologetics into the search bar there and pre-order this book. I know Mother's Day is coming up and it it comes out after Mother's Day, but what you can do is pre-order it for a friend, maybe give them a card with a little note inside saying that the book is coming, maybe throw a a gift card for some coffee in there. It would be a great gift for the mothers in your life. Uh, I, along with several other contributors, led by our general editor, Hilary Ferrer of Mama Bear Apologetics, have put together a book that we hope and pray will really help moms to help their kids to navigate some of the insane ideas that they are being confronted with in their culture, even at really, really young ages. So there are chapters on postmodernism. There are chapters on Marxism. There are chapters on naturalism and skepticism. And I contributed two chapters. One is on new spirituality, which is basically good old-fashioned new age, but with a modern makeover. We see it everywhere. And often it's called Christian or even couched in Christian language. And the other chapter I wrote was one on progressive Christianity, which just basically gives moms a general overview and how to recognize some of those ideas in the materials that are marketed to their kids. And then I also contributed to the feminism chapter, three of us, it took three of us to tackle that one. But I just think it would be a great resource. And here's the thing that I love about it as well is that when you read this book, it is not going to read like a stuffy academic book. There's going to be plenty of information for deep thinkers. It's not, it's not light in the sense that it's just pedestrian and, you know, for kindergartners. It's definitely got some really meaty information, but it's written in a way that makes you feel like you're just sitting down for coffee with another mom. It's, uh, you know, Hillary, who's the general editor there, she is witty and funny. And so we've all kind of tried to write in that voice where it's going to just feel like you're sitting down and chatting over coffee, laughing. And I think it's going to be a great resource. So, so check that out on Amazon. Get it for the mothers in your life. If you're a mom, get it for yourself. It's really going to end up being a gift for your kids because of all you're going to learn and be able to apply to your parenting. Uh, another thing I wanted to let you know about is that on May 4th, I'm going to be hosting Frank Turek's show, the cross-examined uh, show on the Family Radio Network. So that's nationally syndicated. There are you can go to crossexamined.org to find uh, local listings and times. And I think you can watch, or I'm not not watch. You can listen online to that as well. So that's going to be on May fourth. Uh, today I'm excited about the discussion that I'm bringing you today. So recently, Jen Hatmaker had Richard Rohr on her podcast, and I don't know if if you're like me, everywhere I turn, it's Richard Rohr this and Richard Rohr that. I'm seeing posts about him, posts singing his praises, his blog posts, things just shared all over social media. It seems like everybody has an obsession with Richard Rohr right now. And so um, Marsha has really dug in. She's read, we've both actually read one of his books, and but she's really dug in with his blog and, and really trying to get the to the bottom of what he believes. And we've touched on it in the last two podcasts we've recorded together on panentheism. So if you haven't listened to those, uh, listen to those. They might give you more context for the discussion that we're going to have today. But if if you're just joining for today, it's going to still work as a standalone podcast. You won't necessarily be lost or anything like that. We're just going to analyze the ideas that we found in the podcast. But just to give you some context, Richard Rohr has really captured the attention particularly of millennials. There was just an article in the National Catholic Reporter about the number of millennials that showed up to his Universal Christ Conference, which is a four-day event uh, last year in New Mexico's capital. 
And uh, it, it, it makes the point that millennials are discovering the Christian mystical tradition through the work of Richard Rohr. And so he's, he's heavily into mysticism, contemplative spirituality. And uh, so some of the younger, spiritually curious Americans, or sometimes called the nuns, uh, those who identify as spiritual but not religious, uh, are increasingly finding that contemplative style of spirituality very appealing. So I'm going to bring Marsha back on and let's, let's talk about this podcast. Uh, a listener, a listener, um, a Facebook friend sent it to me last night and just asking if I would listen to it and maybe offer some thoughts. It's Jen Hatmaker's podcast. And uh, she had Richard Rohr on as her guest. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this is because I think there are a lot of people who are confused even about Jen Hatmaker. They think, well, you know, she's just really changed her mind on the LGBTQ issue, but everything else kind of fundamentally remained the same. She's still evangelical. And, and you, you hear that kind of thing a lot. Like she's almost kind of this confusing figure because uh, she is perceived by a lot of people to be more conservative theologically, perhaps, but maybe just shifted on the LGBT issue, so there's confusion there. Uh, but it's very clear from her introduction to the podcast that she emphatically endorses Richard Rohr. She called him a hero. She called him a spiritual father. Uh, just a glowing introduction. She even said that uh, she's been reading him for years, and the impression that I got from that, because she mentioned she'd actually quoted him in two or three of her previous books. So the impression I got from that is that she was on this trajectory uh, long before she changed her mind on LGBT is issues. And so I, th I think that's a very um, important point to bring out, that it it's, there was already a bit of a trajectory going on there. And so in the podcast, they talk about his book, The Universal Christ, which is, of course, what we're, we've are we been discussing over the last couple of podcasts here. So we both listened to this. You listened to it last night, and I listened to it this morning because I needed coffee first. <laughs> 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 and um, and so I wanted to ask you about your initial impressions. We both took notes. So I don't know Marsha's notes. She doesn't know mine. We don't really know kind of each other's thoughts. And I thought it would be fun to just kind of discuss it on the podcast without really knowing what the other one thought. And uh, so I'll ask you first, why don't you just give us kind of your initial impressions, your overall impression, and then uh, maybe we can just kind of drill down on it from there. Okay, uh, great. Yes, I think that Jen Hatmaker has been totally taken in by Richard Rohr. I mean, she it's very obvious. She's just sort of besotted with him. Um, thinks he's just absolutely superb, as, as you mentioned. Um, she's, I know she's read the book on the Enneagram, and they discussed that at the beginning, which is a topic I've, I've addressed quite a bit on Facebook. Well, and I know and, almost nothing about the Enneagram, I'll be honest, but apparently from listening to them talk, I resist it because I'm a five, which people have told me I'm a five. So like, <laughs> I just thought it was interesting. They're talking about the Enneagram and anyone who doesn't like the Enneagram, it's because they're a five, you know, <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, <laughs> that's a good way to get at your, you know, anybody who's going to yeah. criticize the Enneagram, you just call them a certain number. It's just because of your personality that the Enneagram could properly diagnose for you if you would just exactly. give it a chance. It's it's yeah it's it's it automatically that means you're a five so you know we basically what you think actually fits the enneagram ha ha you know so it's a, <laughs> yes. just, it's just crazy I'll I'll have to um, sometime you need to read my article on it because it has absolutely no objective basis in reality at all and it came from a man named um, George Gurdjieff who was you know in the in the nineteenth and early 20th century, who was this esoteric uh, teacher. Actually, he was one of the early big influences on the New Age. I knew about Gurdjieff in the New Age because he's a very popular figure in the New Age, and you could almost call him an early New Ager. Um, and the Enneagram came from him. Uh, it was actually developed by his follower, who's probably even more famous than him or as famous, a man named Uspensky, uh, who was a Russian. And Uspensky took the Enneagram and, and kind of made it, you know, into something that could be used. But it was used 
as a way to discover, awaken to the divine self. Mm. And so it's very, very new age. It's very interesting because I do actually need to read up on it because I've had a lot of people ask me about it and I never really know what to say because, you know, I think it's become for a lot of people just nothing but just a tool. It's not really anything spiritual or it's not anything anti-Christian, but it's just this tool to kind of help you figure out how to make your relationships better and things like that. But the thing I've noticed is that many of the writers writing about it are progressive Christians. Exactly. And yes. so that can be a bit of vulnerability there. So yeah, I need to look a little more into it and see what I think about it. And you know why that is, Elisa? The reason a lot of progressives are uh, latching onto it is because of Richard Rohr's book on it. Right, I'm sure. And because of his influence on the progressives. And the reason he wrote it, I think, is because his colleague Cynthia Bergeau had, even though she's an Episcopal priest, she has what is called a wisdom school. Um, and her wisdom school is based on the teachings of Gurdjieff. Okay. And there, so there's a connection there. And I'm, I feel very sure about this, that that's how he got to know about the Enneagram and why he wrote a book on it. Before Richard Rohr, the person who made the Enneagram well-known was Helen Palmer, who's basically a new ager and was a psychic, although she doesn't use that term of her herself. She's very new age, very Gnostic. I've listened to some of her talks on YouTube. Her book on the Enneagram made the Enneagram popular in the new age because she was a new ager. And before that, the way it got to be, it got from the Gnostic tool for a divine self. It got into psychology via new age based psychologists, one of whom had a spirit guide he called Metatron, who was supposedly an angel. He called it his angel. Um, and he got claimed to get messages from Metatron. I mean, this guy was as esoteric as you can be. Um, he and, the, and a couple of other New Age-based psychologists turned the Enneagram into this tool that supposedly helps you uh, not just personality-wise, but spiritually-wise. And I've noticed a lot of Christians who promote it say it actually is going to help diagnose your sins and and help you on your spiritual path as a Christian, which is just going, I mean, uh, to me, it's just so, so ludicrous to make that claim for this. Anyway, I don't want to go on and make this about the Enneagram. No, no, but, that's, but it is something that we need to investigate and, and yes. learn about. And yes. do you ever feel like just the biggest party pooper ever, Marcia? <laughs> Because I, I sure do yeah. sometimes. <laughs> I'm often, I'm often, unfortunately, have to be the party pooper. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I, I hate to break the bad news, folks, but, you know, <laughs> Enneagram has no validity. And, of course, people will say, oh, well, it worked for me and it helped me. But there again, because you already think it's going to help. Uh, and you can read into it what you want, you know. Um, and I think actually what it what it is is that you kind of things you already know about yourself you kind of, you recognize as you do whatever you do with the enneagram. Um, you know I've told people I have absolutely no interest in what number I'm supposed to be because I don't think I am a number. Yeah. And, you that know, means I, you're a five, Marcia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, I'm clearly according to Richard Rohr, I'm a five. Yes. I, I don't like the uh, <laughs> Oh my oh, goodness. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so when I, <laughs> I joke about it quite a bit at the beginning of the at yeah. the be- the pro- uh, podcast they do. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I noticed that um, he talks about how religion at the higher levels. That's an exact quote. Mm-hmm. I noticed are this. Too, ones yeah. who do the contemplative practices. Yeah, he lumps all the religions that, like, like he doesn't make any distinctions between religions as far as truth claims. Right. He's, he's just ma- basically making a claim that there's really not just one way to God, that there's, the you know, every religion kind of gets it in a certain way, and the higher ones do this contemplative stuff. And which actually, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that I kind of noticed a theme, a little bit of a theme of perennialism in this podcast as well. And I know we had planned on talking about that last week and didn't get to it. So how, right. just so we don't lose anybody, let's, why don't you define perennialism, help us understand what it is and, 
it, you know, obviously you picked kind of that, that theme up as well. So help us understand what is perennialism? Yes, perennialism is the belief that behind all religions, there is a divine, one divine reality. So outwardly, the religions look very different and have different practices. Buddhism looks very different from Christianity, and Islam looks very different from Hinduism, etc. But at their core, there is one truth, and they all go towards that one truth. So the differences ultimately don't matter, because there's this one divine reality behind all the beliefs. Um, and perennialism was made currently popular by Aldous Huxley, uh, the famous writer um, <laughs> who uh, wrote 1984. Uh, and Aldous Huxley was wrote a book on perennialism. Now, I have not read it, and I have not studied this topic in depth, but I've had to look into it because of Richard Rohr. And so I've listened to some lectures on it, and I've noticed some people who are perennialists will categorize themselves a certain way, like, uh, um, oh, I am a Christian perennialist, mm -hmm. or someone else will say, you know, he, well, he's a Hindu perennialist, and he's a Jewish perennialist. So the, you know, the, the first word is the outward religion that they're identifying with, but they're identifying it as part of the perennialist philosophy, and they're looking at it through that filter. Uh, so I've noticed that sometimes they'll, they'll use two words like that. And so a Christian perennialist, which I've never heard Richard Rohr say that, but he has talked about the perennial philosophy and he clearly is teaching it, mm -hmm. uh, his book, The Universal Christ and elsewhere. Um, you know, but in a sense, he's a Christian perennialist because he is using the language of Christianity and the language of the Bible and using it to support the idea of perennialism, although, of course, he's not doing it legitimately, or he's doing it in a valid way. Um, he's reading meanings into scripture that are not there, but he's reading his, you know, this perennialist meaning. So this perennialism, a lot of people might say, oh, well, that's just universalism. It's not quite the same thing. Universalism is the idea that everybody goes to a good place when they die. You know, however you view that, some people might say, well, it's heaven, and other people might have other words for it, because clearly not all religions have the concept of heaven, <laughs> but they, they may have some kind of afterplace. Um, so it's not quite the same. It's, a, it's another category. This is more about uh, the truth of all religions being tied into this one divine reality. It's more about that than about where you go when you die. Uh, so we, and we this need is why he's, he describes Jesus as somebody, and we're, I'm going to get into this in a minute, so I won't go too deep here, but he describes Jesus as somebody who was not, uh, speaking in exclusivist language. He was, you know, the, the, the Jesus of, of this view is much more inclusive than the historic Jesus. Exactly. Yes. And he uses that term inclusive a lot and exclusive. He uh, says, he keeps saying in the book, The Universal Christ, that, you know, as we grow in our spirituality and understanding, we become more inclusive and less exclusive. And so he identifies being inclusive as being at this higher level of understanding and, and inclusive would mean, from his point of view, that all you know, all religions have this truth, and Jesus is universal. Everybody is in Christ already. There's no need to um, have a salvation experience or, you know, to, to actually put your trust in Christ. There's no need for that at all. That's an exclusive view. So everything that he— Yeah, that's a tribal is, view. Yes, tribal. That. Yes, he uses they, he uses that word on the podcast. You're right. That's tribal, and we've become Christianity has become tribal, and has lost this wholeness or universal universalism of Christ, and that is where he's coming from. And I think that a lot of people do not realize this is Richard Rohr's view because they don't know what perennialism is. They don't know what panentheism is. They hear him sometimes, you know, quoting scripture or saying. You know, Paul says, and, and, he, and I'll talk about Jesus, 
and they think that he's being orthodox or somewhat orthodox because they don't understand the meaning behind his words. You, know, you have to know the meaning behind his words and you have to read a lot of him um, or listen to a lot of him to see that what he's saying is not historic Christianity at all. It's 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 very much a counterfeit, you know, I, I would call it a counterfeit Christianity. It oh, appears, yeah, I agree 100 percent. Yeah, it appears to be Christian, but it is not Christian in any way at all. Uh, any other thoughts on the podcast? Oh yeah, um, yeah, I have. <laughs> yeah, I, I I wanted to say something about the contemplative practices because he in the in his book The Universal Christ he has a section on it, and he just basically says you need to do these. Basically, it's this mystical kind of going within thing um, through Eastern meditation or some kind of meditation where you're closing off or shutting down your thinking mind. Um, and you have to do that to get into this other awareness, to become aware of these truths that he's speaking of. And he's actually said, um, I think that short little interview that I read right before our first podcast, he did a short interview on his book, The Universal Christ. And he said, you have to do this change of consciousness. And it's through the contemplative practices. And I agree because contemplative the contemplative spirituality is something I have been reading about and writing about and talking about for at least 20 years. And I have several articles on my website. Um, and I agree that it can change your consciousness, which, which, which I translate as it changes your view of reality. And so, in effect, he's saying you have to change your view of reality to see what I'm saying. And he calls in his book, The Universal Christ, he calls it the new paradigm and claims that Paul understood, recognized the new paradigm of this universal Christ. Yeah. Now, just for clarification for anyone listening, when you said you agree with him that it does change your consciousness, you're not saying that's a good thing, though, right? Right, right, exactly, yes. I am saying that this is this is something that that shifts you from reality as it is and the, and the truth. It shifts you from the truth and the true Jesus into another view, into another reality. And having done... For many years, I did Eastern meditation for, for four, 14 years when I was in the New Age. And so I know that it it does shift your view of reality. You start seeing things in a different way. And I've heard many people say this who have done not only the Eastern meditation, but who have done these contemplative practices. They actually, but they think it's good. And they start seeing things a different way. And they think it's a good thing because they think they're uncovering the truth, the real truth. And that's the, you know, I mean, in my opinion, that's what the Matrix was all about. You know, take the, this pill, I think it was a blue pill, to wake up. Yeah. Well, in, in Buddhism, you you have to, that's the same thing. They don't say change your consciousness, but it's the same idea. You have to recognize this new reality. And it sounds to me a lot, that's what, like, what Richard Rohr is saying. And that's why he emphasizes these contemplative practices. And he mentions them on the podcast. Um, yeah, I wrote a few other notes. Um that he said, uh, Jesus, uh, it's too individualized. The gospel mm -hmm. is individualized because it's more about your personal salvation instead of this universal salvation uh, that everything's in Christ. And he, he refers to uh, the gospel of John, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. He, uh, this, he does this in his book, too, and I've heard him do it in other uh, interviews. He takes the beginning of those books or the first chapters of those books, which of course talk about the supremacy of Christ. Um, and he, it, to him, that's talking about this universal Christ that's in creation. And he, you know, mis, misinterprets uh, verses. And we talked about that in the first mm -hmm. part. Yeah. There's just this, this straw man that he constructs through the whole yes. podcast about Christians. Yes. He, he says, he even said at one point that he's taught all over the world, uh, different cultures, different denominations, and what he consistently finds is that the view of Christians that he meets, like their view of the gospel, he called well-disguised narcissism. Yes. And, and he's referring to this individualistic type of salvation. And so what he's criticizing, there's a, there's a grain of truth there. What he's criticizing is 
uh, perhaps the overemphasis of some Christians on just like fire insurance salvation. Like this is only about where I'm going to go when I die. And I think that you and I would agree that if that's somebody's view of the gospel, that's not a complete view of the gospel. But in his language, he's completely denying that there's an individual element to salvation, that salvation is not about individuals. Right. It's about the world. It's about all people, that Jesus is saving all people, not individuals. Yes. And he uses the term, the collective. Um, And he's also, I wanted to quickly mention without going into it, he's a union. He's very much a follower of Carl Jung's ideas and whom I'm also familiar with from the new age and specifically from astrology, because Jung's ideas are used a lot by, by contemporary astrologers. And he he has he has references to Jungian ideas and to Jung in his book, The Universal Christ, which I did not go into. I think I gave one little quick sentence on it because it was just my article was already too long, mm-hmm. and I <laughs> I just could not I just could not address everything. But he he does express some Jungian views, and so he uses this Jungian type term, the collective. And says it's this collective salvation because everything's already in Christ. There's no need. It goes against individual. The idea of individual salvation is completely counter to his idea. Mm-hmm. So, and it's funny you said straw man because I actually have that in my notes. Yeah. Well, it's just a caricature, and he actually even admitted that it's a bit of a caricature. Yeah. What he's offering is, and he basically says that evangelicals or whoever he's talking about, he's talking about us, whoever he's talking about, yeah. people like you and me, that basically none of us would believe what we do without the threat of hell, that it's all about just our personal escape from this mean, wrathful God that's going right. to just dangle us all over the hell, the flames of hell. And, and so he, you know, his whole point is that God's not in the business of even saving individuals. We need to stop thinking that way. And, um, and so just, you know, I was just a little perplexed because you find the concept of individual salvation all throughout the New Testament, not at the expense of, uh, you know, not an, an overly individualistic thing where it's just, oh right. yeah, here's your get out of hell free card. You're good to go, right. go live your life. I mean, of course, right. but, um, but yeah, there, there's this absolute denial. In fact, he even said like evangelicals get so bent when I take hell away from them because they don't want to believe this unless they're doing it under fear of punishment or fear of, of, of hell, which, which really shows me that he doesn't understand the real gospel because we, res- we, we love God because he first loved us. Right. We, we're, I mean, yes, there, there is the concept of hell that exists, but that's because of God's holiness. And that's something they don't even touch on, on this podcast is that yes. God is holy, that he, right. that he, in order to, he is perfect. He is entirely separated from sin. And as people who are sinners, like we're, we're hopeless unless there's some kind of rescue plan, which of course is why Jesus came. But he, but see, he would say that what I'm saying is just completely false. Yes, he doesn't. You're right. He does not understand scripture and he, um, you know, he ignores, uh, now that you brought that up, that's a good point in his book. There's nothing about God's holiness or God's righteousness or the righteousness of Christ. There's nothing about that. And he, he very much undermines sin in uh, the universal Christ. In his book, he, 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 he kind of just, he makes it just almost nothing. He says sin is something that was committed one time by somebody between the um, Euphrates and the, um, I can't think of the name of the Tigris. Other. Yes, the ti- thank you. The Tigris and the Euphrates. And there was a sin committed there between those two rivers. And, you know, just all this stuff has been built up on it, all this doctrine of sin, which is just, you know, he, he very much undermines sin. He, he doesn't believe in the penal substitution of Christ on the cross. So in order, you know, and that makes sense because in order to have his view, you can't accept um, the uh the importance of sin, and you can't accept this holiness and righteousness of God, who who must have wrath on sin because of His holiness. And I think uh, it was J. Gresham Machen who wrote that the kind of God we would have if if He didn't punish sin, if there wasn't justice for sin, um, 
if that God existed at all, his heaven would be full of sin. And, yes, and, and yes. that's, I think, something that a lot of people don't consider. Right. It's not because we're not coming to Christ because we're afraid of hell or that, you know, well, I better do it because he's threatening to send me to hell. It's, it's because we, we grasp how deeply we are sinners and how deeply uh, our sin offends God and, and that there can be no unity there until a price is paid for that. And it's just, it, it's kind of sad because, well, and when I get into, I have a couple of thoughts written down too, but I wanted to comment because you, you mentioned that he doesn't understand the Bible. Right. And I, I remembered something from his book on the Trinity, The Divine Dance, because he, he, like I said, he goes out of his way to say how biblical he is, and then he'll, he'll reference a few scriptures here and there. But in The Divine Dance, he talks about the way he interprets the Bible, and he calls it the Jesus hermeneutic. And mm-hmm. so here's a quote. He says, just interpret scripture the way Jesus did. He ignores, denies, or openly opposes his own scriptures whenever they are imperialistic, punitive, exclusionary, or tribal. So that's Mm -hmm. a quote from the book. So he's saying Mm -hmm. Jesus denied the scriptures. He opposed the scriptures. Anytime there was a theme of imperialism, punitive, I mean, that's that has to do with punishment, anything exclusionary or tribal. But when I read the New Testament, Jesus talks in punitive terms all the time. Oh, in yeah. In fact, he talks about hell more than anyone does. And he's yes. very exclusionary, even condemning three whole cities to hell when they didn't receive him after witnessing his miracles. And, exactly. and another point is that Jesus never denied the scriptures. In fact, never. he calls them the word of God over and over again. What he denied was maybe faulty interpretations and things that the Pharisees were adding to the scriptures. Yes. But he never denied the scriptures. He never opposed the scriptures. And then the one example, I looked at the footnote he gave because he said, you know, see for yourself and then gave a footnote. And I thought, well, what's he talking about? And he goes yeah. to a verse where Jesus is reading and be- Jesus leaves off um, or he reads to a certain point and doesn't read. Further. Oh, yes. Isaiah 61. Yeah. And, and so yes. he's saying, well, there you go. And, and it was just like, that's your example of this, you know? Yes, that's where Jesus is reading in the synagogue, I think in Luke 4, and he's reading Isaiah 61, and it's the prophecy of the Messiah. Yeah. And he stops in the middle because he's fulfilling the first part. The second part of the prophecy in Isaiah is going to be fulfilled when Christ comes again. So he stops in the middle. It's not because he doesn't agree with the rest of the scripture. Right. Oh, uh, that sounds just like something Richard Rohr would do. And I, you know, either he's now, you know, could he be doing, I don't know if he's doing that deliberately or does he truly not understand, you know, and where did he get, you know, well, obviously he was very influenced by Tah- Tahir de Chardin and maybe he got some of these ideas from, from him. But, you know, you just wonder, how can he ignore such obvious things as Mm -hmm. Jesus' very exclusive statements? Um, I wanted to quickly say he clearly doesn't understand the gospel because one of the things he said on the podcast was he talked about how Christians think you have to be good and live a a good moral life go to church to deserve divine love. Well, no, no real Christian thinks that at all. I mean, that is not, you know, some there may be some people who think it and some people who think they're Christians who believe that, but that's not what the gospel is. The gospel is to trust in Christ. We can't, it's not anything we can do, no matter how good we are, how many times we go to church or how moral we are, right. can't save ourselves and we never deserve divine love. That's why it's grace. Right. And, and he mentions grace when he's talking about this and I'm thinking, but he doesn't really understand it because it is because of grace that what he's saying is not true. It's it's right, not, right. you know, it's not, yeah, we know all that. We know we can't, you know, get get God's favor by doing things. It's given to us because we don't deserve it through the work of Christ on the cross and trusting Christ. So he he doesn't get that at all. No, he doesn't. And there's there's a common progressive critique of evangelicalism I see quite a bit. 
mm-hmm. where they'll they'll call what we're doing as like a moralistic type salvation that it's all about not sinning. It's just who can who can not yeah. sin the most. And you know, I, I'm sure that some people have fallen into that trap. And you know, I'm not going to say that nobody believes that. But the but like you just said, the whole point of the gospel is we know that we that we fall short. No matter, I mean, our righteousness is filthy rags. But at the same time, there are instructions in the Bible on morality. And, and we want to live moral lives. We want to grow in our sanctification and in our holiness and being conformed into the image of Christ. Uh, I was just reading uh, 1 John last night where he says, I'm writing this to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone mm-hmm. does sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. And so mm-hmm. the point is that we are, we are supposed to try to live moral lives, but that doesn't mean that's what we're basing our salvation in. In fact, our salvation is based in the fact we know we can't uh, live right. up to that, to that standard. Exactly. And Ephesians 2 says we're saved by grace through faith so that we may do good works. You know, the the works come after the salvation. They're the fruit of salvation. And it's in the power of the Holy Spirit that we grow in Christ and that we're sanctified and become conformed to the image of Christ. It's not our own efforts. If we try to do it on our own and what we think we should do apart from relying on on Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to fail. And, you know, he and he clearly does not he doesn't know this or he doesn't understand it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, any other thoughts you got there? Any notes? Uh, no, I think what I what I got the rest of it were things that we we touched on last week about um, being in Christ, and he thinks Paul saw that. And there was one statement you and I both noticed that he said nothing can. Well, it's a closing statement he gives to Jen Hatmaker. Oh yes, nothing can separate us from God except the thought that can separate. And I think you broke up a little bit there. So for anyone who didn't catch that, it's nothing can separate us from God except the thought that we're separated from God. And he claims, he's like, that's Romans 8. He claims that's what Romans 8 is teaching. Exactly. Yeah, he uses, he'll go to the Bible. And I know people who don't know scripture are going to think, wow, he really knows the Bible. And uh, they think, oh, well, that's what Romans 8 is about. And of course, nothing in Romans 8 says that at all. No, in fact, this is exactly what you pointed out last week, is that he'll take scriptures that were written to Christians and apply them to everyone. So when Paul says, for I'm convinced... um, that neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities, that famous verse about nothing can separate us from yes. the love of God, that's written to Christians. That, yes. that isn't a universal verse for all mankind. That was written yeah. to the Roman the church in Rome. And, um, and he kind of did a little bait and switch there where he changed the context, um, which you pointed out, he does that quite a bit in his book. Yes. You pointed yeah. that out last week. Well, and w- one thing I, I noticed, a couple of notes I have here, was that in the beginning of the podcast, she asked him, um, I thought she was a very good interviewer, by the way. I, I mean, yeah. I don't want to just sit here and like, you know, I mean, there's obviously some, some pauses. I thought she asked him some really good questions. And one of the things that she asked him was why God put him on this earth. Why does he think God put him on this earth? Right. And uh, in that answer, he said that his passion is to clarify the gospel. And he said that what he, what he wants Christians to do is see the gospel as a liberating message for the earth for people, and for history. But then he goes on to say, it hasn't basically done that. And he says, it hasn't done that in its first 2,000-year iteration. Yes. It hasn't come across that way. So so he says, it would give me great joy if I could make it more attractive, more meaningful, more true. I don't know how you make something more true, but... Yeah. <laughs> um, and he says, that's why I was put on this earth. So he's he's basically saying that he was put on earth to correct the fact that Christians have gotten it wrong for 2,000 years, which yes. I just thought was a, a just a crazy claim. I, I just, I, I couldn't even believe he was saying it because he, it's like he's not even trying to pretend that he's trying to get back to something. He's saying, no, we've gotten it wrong for 2,000 years, and part of the purpose God put me here is to, to clarify it finally. Exactly. Yes, you're, you're right. He does make this. It's a very grandiose claim. And then he says he wants to clarify the gospel, but then the whole podcast is basically an attack on the gospel. Exactly. It's so ironic what he claims, because it's just all the opposite 
what he's doing is the opposite of what he says he's doing. He's well, and of course, correcting Christianity hasn't been wrong for two thousand years. You right. know, that's his assumption right away, and he's going to correct it. Um, you know, he has the truth that he goes on to discuss in the podcast and and is in his books, and. You know, Christians have just just need to recognize he's giving this truth, um, and that we've just been all wrong all this time. And of course, that should be a big red flag to anybody, anyone. It re- yes, it really anyone. should. In fact, I was sitting at a table with Jay Werner Wallace once, and someone had brought up kind of this new idea in theology, and he said, "Wait, before you even say what it is, I want to know what church father, like, knew about this <laughs> and and promoted this." And I thought that was kind of an interesting way to look at it. It's like, we know that the fathers are fallible. They're not, you know, in, in inerrant scripture, but, right, but right. you know, ideas, there's not going to be anything brand new in 2019 that somebody didn't kind of have an idea of back in the day. And so I kind of thought that was a, an interesting way to look at it. He didn't even care what it was. He just wanted yeah. to know if there was a church father that <laughs> at least one that knew about this and promoted it. But but this is interesting because um, his view, his view of the gospel and what he would describe as our view of the gospel, I think we can get to the bottom of it with a statement he made about understanding God. So he said, neural scientists have told him that our brains can't even conceive of eternity and in infinity. They just literally shut down. And I think he's right about that. I think mm-hmm. that that really matches my experience at least. Um, and so we have to use anthropomorphic language to describe God because we can't comprehend God. And actually, yeah. I think you and I would both agree with that. There are We are limited when we talk about God, we're limited by our intellectual capacity. We're limited by language. So we're really only capable of talking about God um, in anthropomorphic language. Would you agree with right. that too? Yes, I do. I do agree with that. I think that, and of course, I think God uses anthropomorphic language of himself in scripture yeah. because that is the way that we can understand him. And that is, you know, language. I think God created us with language and a capacity for language so that he could communicate things to us. And we can understand him and know him in in that way. But it in no way completely, of course, comprehends God because he's uncreated. He's other. And even though we're made in the image of God, which actually, and the idea of what that means is disputed among (laughs) nobody. Nobody seems to agree on what that means. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have my own ideas of it. But even though we're made in his image, um, we we just are not we're so different from God on the level of being creation versus creator. And God is spirit and he's omnipresent and he's omniscient. And that's so far away from us. But he has given us tools to understand and know who he is you know, based on our level of understanding. So, you know, on the one hand, it's wrong to say, well, we can totally understand God and everything. And it's, and he's just really kind of like us, except he's sort of a superhuman. And on the other hand, it's wrong to say, well, he's just so beyond us. There's no way we can know anything about him. We can't talk about him, which actually I think is something Ilya Delio says. Mm. We just can't even talk about God. We can't even know him. He's so remote. And this was sort of a Gnostic idea as well that, God is just so remote. He had to have these intermediaries. And um, that's a wrong idea, too. You know, the the biblical idea is, yes, God is very different and is other and is uncreated. Um, but he's given us the tools, uh, the, ability, the language and the ability to have a concept and the concept of who God is and to understand it to the degree that we need to. Right. And that's like he gives to... us the metaphor of father. He wants us to yeah. see him as a father. Exactly. Um, but that that's anthropomorphic because he's not yes. literally our birth father. So right. yeah, right. so we we would agree that there that we have to use that kind of language to describe God. The Bible right. is filled with that language. God talks about right. uh turning his face or uh you know using his wings to cover us. He doesn't have wings. He doesn't literally have a face, but right. that's the kind of language that helps us relate with him and understand him. You put that really well. I think that was very clear. And I agree with you. Um, and so, so with that said, I think this gets to the, what I'm about to say gets to the fundamental flaw in his reasoning. 
So he said something along the lines of, because of that, because we have to use anthropomorphic language to describe God, what we do then, and he's talking about, again, you and me, is we break it down into categories of sin and judgment and hell, and basically the whole gospel paradigm that the church has affirmed for 2,000 years. He's saying, because we can't really understand God, we're just putting him into these little boxes of sin and judgment mm-hmm. in heaven and hell and all of that stuff. But here's what's so just ironic about that, uh, because he says we need to see God as much more inclusive and merciful and non-tribal and all of that stuff. But Richard Rohr would actually have to have full knowledge of God in order to be able to say that sin, judgment, hell <laughs> is the wrong view. Like he would have to be the one guy that actually sees God correctly in order to be able to say that his view of God is right and ours is wrong. Because if he doesn't have full knowledge of God, then he, according to his logic, he's just putting God in the box he prefers. And, and when I was listening to that, I just was thinking in my mind, you know, I think I prefer a much more humble approach, which is to take the words the Bible gives us to describe God and his plan and his gospel and do our best to live that out because that's the way he wants us to understand him. Those are the words he gave us to describe himself. And um, the Bible does talk about sin and judgment and heaven and hell and a gospel that is bloody and with Jesus taking sin upon himself, fulfilling Isaiah 53, this, the, um, the sins being laid upon him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he affirmed that that scripture was about him. Mm-hmm. And, and so um, I thought that was, that really kind of got to the fundamental flaw in his reasoning, which really shows that it's a house of cards. He's just saying that because that's what he wants it to be. There's, it's not based on anything objective. It's not based on any kind of facts. It's just what he thinks it is. And, and so all these people are following him saying, oh, yeah, that, that sounds good. Like, we can't really understand God, so we just put him in our little boxes. But actually, mm-hmm. there's a lot more... Uh, evidence and just biblical data to support the idea of what the church has believed for 2000 years than this kind of new thing he's trying to bring in. Exactly. I mean, you're exactly right. I agree. He's, he, it's a way of, uh, it's, it's sort of a straw man because he's saying, yeah, we just don't understand God. So we put him in these boxes, but that's not, that's not what Christians are doing. Christians are getting that from scripture right? and he makes it into something else that we're doing it because we don't really understand. And so we have to have little boxes to make us feel comfortable and safe, which is how I think he would put it. Cause he said yeah. a lot of things like that. And it's, it's a way of, basically denying the truth of scripture, as well as mischaracterizing Christianity, which he does over and over again, which yeah. it, which tells me he doesn't really know what Christianity is. Yeah, I agree. And that was the thing that just kept coming into my mind as, as I was listening, is that I, I don't know if he's, or others, you know, I'm not even just picking on him, but yeah. have, have encountered the real gospel, because often... In my experience, people are heading toward progressive Christianity because of maybe abuse or hypocrisy they saw in the church, mm-hmm. or maybe a false gospel, an overly legalistic gospel where it was all <laughs> about works or you know how short your hair can be and things like that. Yeah. And and um, and that's why when I when my faith when I went through my faith crisis, rather than rejecting what I grew up with. I, I went on a quest for what the real thing was and mm. what, what, what historically Christians have believed. And, and that just made sense to me rather than deny my own paradigm or whatever, you know, uh, world I, I grew up in. I, I wanted to find out what the real thing was. And, and if I'm going to reject Christianity, I'm going to reject the real thing. And, right. and so, you know, through that quest, I discovered that, you know, I I was given the real gospel. Not all of it was perfect. And I've corrected some views, uh, you know, some theological views that I grew up with and, uh, and that, but, but it was the, the genuine gospel. And I just pray that a lot of people who are rejecting Christianity won't do that unless they really know what they're rejecting and rejecting the real thing. And so, yeah, that, that really stood out to me that there's just this caricature of, of, of Christians. Another thing I noticed is that he confuses categories. Mm. And he said, he made a statement about 
Christianity and, and because of, um, I can't honestly remember what his thing was that made him say this, but he says, because of this, Christians can't be racist, which of course we agree with Christians yes. should not be racist, <laughs> right. but he, then he says, you know, we need to view blacks and Hindus and gays kind of all on the same plane. So he's in the context of talking about racism, he mentions Yes, one ethnic category, but then he mentions Hindus, which is a religious philosophical category. Right. And then he mentions gays, which is more of a moral category. And so, you know, he's taking the identity of maybe a philosophical and religious group and the identity of a sexual uh, preference and making that into almost like an ethnic identity. Yes. And and it just kind of floats by and everybody goes, oh, yeah, that's right. That's why we should <laughs> not make any distinctions there. Um, and so just, I, I guess as we close, and I'm going to let you kind of give some advice to people if they're going to dive into some of this stuff, but the advice I would give just in the very small amount I've, I've been exposed to with Richard Rohr and panentheism and all of this, these things is honestly, so much of this can, can be thought through with just some good critical thinking, make sure that the terms that the person is using are the same or defined the same way as you're understanding them. When, when somebody says even words like God is in, what does that mean to them? What does that word in actually mean to them? Mm -hmm. And uh, so don't, you know, don't take for granted that you're defining words the same way. And the second thing would be application of scripture. Really look for context. Someone can throw a bunch of verses at you, but if, if they're taking them out of context or applying them to a group of people they weren't actually applied to originally, then that's a bit of a bait and switch. And then the third thing would be confusing categories. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we need to make sure that we're thinking clearly about um, what's underneath different categories. And so those were kind of the, the two or three practical things that came up as I was listening, because I know a lot of people are going to listen to this. And actually, I would encourage anyone listening to this podcast, don't just take our word for it. Listen for yourself. Go listen to Jen Hatmaker's podcast and, yes. um, you know, read Richard Rohr's blog or a book or something and, and don't, don't, you know, we're, we're fallible, we're human, we're analyzing it the best we can, but do your own discernment, you know, right. compare what you're reading and what you're hearing with what you're reading in the scripture. And, um, so that would be my advice. What would yours be, Marsha? Yes. It's hard to add to that because that's really excellent advice you gave there. Um, I agree with all of that. Um, People need to always investigate what other people are saying. Uh, and because it sounds good doesn't mean it's true. Because they're citing scripture doesn't mean it's true. Um, we need And we need to understand what they're saying, what they mean by it. And also, if they're using scriptures, look at those scriptures and not just the context, but what is the meaning of the words there not just what you think it might mean, but compare scripture to scripture. Mm -hmm. I think comparing scripture to scripture is very a very valuable tool because if uh, Paul is talking about being in Christ here in Colossians and then in Ephesians, and then, you know, look at all the passages and the context. Um, what does it mean? Because he's not going to be teaching panentheism here in Colossians, and then another part of Scripture is going to be teaching against it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's and 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 also I would another piece of advice that I think I I may have touched on last week is for Christians to please understand the nature of God, uh, because this is the root of a uh, part of the root of of Richard Rohr's theological problems here is not understanding the biblical nature of, of God as we as we see it in scripture and we touched on it the holiness and righteousness his wrath on sin um, you know read some books maybe that on the, on the divine attributes some solid books by respected theologians um, or as you mentioned last week your podcast with Brian Huffling um, Brian Huffling has a blog and that is most of it is about the nature of God and the character of God. It's very helpful. Um, and there's other people out there. But I find that a lot of times we don't really are we aren't really grounded in an understanding of that. And that can lead to a lot of confusion um, or thinking that somebody is right when actually they're not being right at all. So we just have to be really careful. And of course, this is why the New Testament has warnings over and over again to the church that 
we have to watch out for false teachings. Um, you know, Paul said that uh, people will arise, teachers will arise from among you mm-hmm. who will falsely and lead many astray. In other words, they're going to be in the church or, or they're going to say they're Christian. And so it's very important to keep that in mind that, and also to understand we can be deceived. Some Christians tend to think they can't be deceived, mm-hmm. but we can be, or the New Testament wouldn't keep giving warnings about it. Right. <laughs> and some of the early Christians were deceived. I mean, this is what Paul writes about in some of his letters, and it's also in First John. So, yeah. you know, we're we're. I'm not saying we can lose our salvation, but I'm saying we can be led astray. And and being a Christian is not just sitting back and, and letting things happen. We have to be active and proactive, and we have to work on it. It's work. But it's, of course, a, a work for, for, for Christ, and, and, it's a, and it's honoring Christ. You know, the more we know and understand, then the more we can grow in Him. And that is, of course, the whole point. <laughs> yeah, that's great advice. And I'm just reminded as you're talking of you know, you said they'll rise up from within you. And that's why they're so convincing because these are people that we've come to know and love and maybe even followed on social media for a long time or read their books and really maybe was ministered to by someone's book somewhere back in the past. And now they're, they're teaching false doctrine and the Bible says it's going to happen. And, and so we have to, we have to be discerning. And I'm also reminded of the false prophets in the old Testament their message was peace, peace when there is no peace. And right. so it's very tempting to latch on to a message that feels good. Like I want to believe that yeah. everyone in the world is going to be saved. And it's not about any kind of individual salvation. That that would actually be great. I would love that. Like that would feel really good to yeah. think there's really nothing to worry about. Like there's right. just, there's, there's no judgment. There's, n- there's none of that stuff. And, um, and that doesn't mean that I follow Jesus because I'm under threat of hell, but it's because I know that I'm a sinner and there needs to be justice for that. And I, and I'm so deeply humbled and grateful for the price that Jesus paid on the cross. How could I not love him? And part of that gratefulness comes from recognizing that one day when we're with him face to face, we will be outside of the presence of sin and evil and rape and murder and poverty, and injustice, and deceit, and and all wicked things. God, in his great plan, has made a way to quarantine those things away from us forever. Because if there's no justice for those things, then, like J. Gresham Machen said, his heaven will be full of sin, and we'll just be coexisting with all of those things forever. So God's plan is better than anything I could come up with. And when we grasp it, I think that's when the the gratefulness truly comes out. And so, um, yeah, just just remember that, that the message is always going to be something that really sounds good, something that, that would make you yes. feel really good to believe. But we don't go by feelings. Uh, we go by, by truth, which doesn't always feel good. So... Right. Exactly. All right. Well, Marsha, thanks for thanks for being here. And I think we I think we covered it. Yeah, we covered a lot. <laughs> and I really enjoyed doing it. Thank you so much for having me on as your guest. enjoyed listening to this podcast, you can sign up to receive my posts by email by going to alisachilders.com and clicking the subscribe button or simply subscribe to the Alisa Childers podcast on iTunes.